Hello, I'm very honoured today to be joined by Miko Peled, who is a very distinguished um, Israeli-American author, activist, I would also note karate instructor, which is, I think, something which particularly excited me. I only got, I tried doing karate as a kid, I only got one mark, I think, on my belt. So a work in progress there. Um, <laughs> Uh, he's the author, author of many things, such as The General Sun, The Journey of an Israeli in Palestine, Injustice, The Story of the Holy Land Foundation 5. He does lots of speaking. Um, hello, firstly. Great, great honour to have you. People are very excited. Great to be with you. Thank you. No worries. I just want to start by talking about your family, which is just, I mean, just fascinating, because you were born in Jerusalem in 1961, um, and your grandfather signed Israel's Declaration of Independence. Your father fought in the first 1948 Arab-Israeli War, served as a general in the Six Day War of 1967. I mean, it's quite something. You're from, I'd say, a very famous, high-profile Zionist family. So just tell me a bit about that. Sure. Well, you're absolutely right. That's exactly my background. My background couldn't be any more patriotic and Zionist. Um, it just couldn't be, you know, I mean, with that kind of a background, you know, a great uncle who was a president. So, I mean, growing up in that kind of environment, there's no way you don't become a patriot. I mean, patriotism is not, you know, is not something you learn about or you develop. It's there all the time. It's in your life. It's in your family. It's everybody talks about, you know, the probably the most the most common conversation whether it's you know the smaller family or the extended family is you know is the state the welfare of the state the benefit of the state how we you know sacrifice for the state how we work for the state you know that was the most important uh, conversation that was the most important objective the state the state the state almost sounds almost pretty fascist actually when you think about it um and um you know my father was a was a general you know, of the generation where these generals were held, were like, you know, gods of the Olympics, the, the generals of, of 1967 war, you know, and uh, growing up in the Israeli school system, you learn about the generals, you see their pictures everywhere on Independence Day, when you have the little Israeli flags, you know, hanging everywhere, you have the flags with pictures of the generals. I mean, every, you know, street names are street, are named, streets are named after them and battles they fought and, and, units they commanded. I mean, Israel is a very militarized society. So to be part of that from the inside, you know, was an enormous source of pride for me. Enormous source of pride. What was it that made you break from that? Because the vast majority of people don't, let's be blunt. So what do you think, What just explain how you kind of shifted? So these things never happen, you know, uh, instantaneously. There's always a process. Uh, but I only realized that it was a process having looked back. You know, when I wrote the General Son some 10 years ago, 11 years ago, that's when I realized there was a process. I remember my mother talking about being a young woman in Jerusalem in 1948 and seeing um, the Israeli troops or Zionist troops taking over the Palestinian neighborhoods and, and the process of ethnic cleansing of West Jerusalem, which was, you know, complete, 100 percent. Not a single Palestinian was allowed to remain in West Jerusalem. She was offered a Palestinian home and thankfully she refused, you know. And then she talked about the looting and how wrong it was. So at that time, as a child, hearing these stories, it didn't make any sense because we're the good guys. But it, but it remained there. You know, I didn't realize how important it was till later on. Uh, my father, after the '67 war, while still in uniform, started talking about negotiating with the Palestinians. And so they weren't called just Arabs anymore. Now they're called Palestinians, and they actually have their own identity and they have rights. And and we did some things that were wrong um, by occupying them and so on. So you know that. All of that, you know, was happening in the back as, as I was growing up. And then probably the biggest thing, and this is, you know, I always say big shifts in our thinking, in our ideology, sadly happen usually as a result of a tragedy. And so in my case, my sister's little girl was killed in a suicide attack in 1997. And that's precisely the kind of shing, the, the, the kind of event that, that shifts you, that forces you to take a closer look at your life, at your belief system. And and thinking about Israel, thinking about the Palestinian issue was not something outside of my life. It was always part of my life. And when that happened, I realized, again, looking back, I should say I realized, but uh, the impact was at the moment, was that we tend to talk about these enormous, enormously horrifying events in passing. 
There was a suicide attack, five people were killed, moving on. There's another attack, 20 people were killed, moving on. There's, nobody ever takes a pause and say, what, what happened? So in that particular, and this was a long time ago, September of 1997, this is a very long time ago, uh, three young Palestinians decided to kill themselves, blow themselves up and take civilians around them, including this 13-year-old girl who happened to be my sister's little girl. Okay, we can't just let it go. We've got to talk about this. We've got to figure out what in the world, how does this happen? What kind of an environment was created that this, this okay. kind of tragedy can take place? And so I, I embarked on this journey, which I didn't realize then was going to be a journey, but that became the subtitle of my book, the, you know, the Journey of an Israeli in Palestine, from my very safe and privileged sphere as an Israeli in, you know, in Palestine, really, although at the time I didn't realize that into this other area where Palestinians resided, where these other people lived, these people that I knew were dangerous and they were killers and they wanted to hate to kill us and, and you know, that sort of thing. So that was, uh, that was really the process. And it was, took a few years actually after. I didn't really start doing this until 2000, 2001, really embarking on this journey. But that was, and then meeting Palestinians and hearing the Palestinian story for the first time. So that was how I ended up, you know, doing what I do and speaking the way I do. I'm interested in dehumanization just because, I mean, if, if we're, we're honest, many of the great atrocities of our history, dehumanization is often at the very core, certainly as an explanation of how atrocities are become permissible and how oppression becomes permissible. Because as soon as you start seeing those who are oppressed as fellow human beings, it becomes much harder to rationalize their oppression. So colonialism is always based on the dehumanization of those who are colonized, for example. And, you know, Britain has a long history of doing this, uh, not even that far from our shores, Ireland, you know, the dehumanization of the Irish, um, which is what allowed the Great Potato Famine, for example, in the 19th century, when half of all Irish people either died or fled. So I'm just interested in that kind of dehumanization, how it worked, how you saw it in terms of how Palestinians were dehumanized. And I guess how you you broke up, you, you, that, because obviously part of this process is you Palestinians became humans, so they were humanized. Yeah. And, and you said about your, I mean, that horrible, horrific thing for you to go through. Sister, a lot of people would have gone the other way. They would have, they would have done, they would double down on dehumanization, I would say. So what, I'm just interested in that, that kind of dehumanization you heard and experienced and how you broke from that, you know, in a way that others didn't after such a horrific tragedy. Well, you're right. I mean, dehumanization is 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 a, is a crucial ingredient in colonization and atrocities and certainly in genocide, which is what I believe is taking place in Palestine. Without dehumanization, it's not going to work. So Israel developed a very, um, very effective education system which dehumanizes Palestinians so it's it's in every aspect of your life growing up now you hear it you hear the conversations around you you see what is being said in the media you see the reality where Palestinians reside and exist in an entirely different reality than you do and the explanation when it's given is that they are just you know, they're primitive, they're stupid, they're lazy, they, you know what I mean? The, in Hebrew, the, the, the way to say that something is poorly done is to say Arab labor. Whereas, you know, the most magnificent homes that Israelis live in today are Palestinian homes that they stole. But never mind, you know, you don't want to ruin a good story with the facts. So that is the reality, you know, you grow up in it, it is everywhere. And where do you see Palestinians as an Israeli? You see them collecting the trash, you see them doing the landscape, working in the gardens, you see them cleaning the streets, uh, and you hear about them as terrorists. You know, you never hear that there's a Palestinian writer or poet or philosopher or mathematician or scientist or doctor, you know, and if you do, then it's the exception to the rule. And then when you drive along the highways throughout the country, you see very clearly one side of the road, you see the it, where Israelis live, and it's modern and it's Western and it's lovely, you know, and it's developed. And the, you look at the, you know, we didn't say Palestinians, you look at the Arab side and it's not as developed and it's not as clean and there's no spaces and there are no sidewalks and there's no, and there are no playgrounds for kids. And the explanation is that, well, you know, they're just not as developed. Look, I mean, we came, you know, 50 years ago, hundred years ago, and look what we did with this country. They've had it for all this time. And, you know, they just, you know, it was a wasteland. We don't even know that 
we're never told that we actually stole the riches of this country, that we stole the entire cities that were built, that we stole, you know, agricultural produce and, and, and fertile lands and cultivated, uh, you know, farmlands and so on. So that's, it, it's everywhere. It's everywhere. And how you get beyond that is you meet people. It's the only way to get beyond that. And I was very, very fortunate uh, in two in two ways. One was I was living in the U.S. I was living in California at the time in San Diego, and I c- came across a group of Palestinians, or I should say, and it's kind of an Israeli Jewish Palestinian, what was called a dialogue group. This was a long, long time ago, the early two thousands. They were kind of popular at the time, and I was invited to one. And it happened to be at the home of a Palestinian, and that was my first encounter with Palestinians. And I'm sitting at the home of these people, and uh, I realized I've never met Palestinians before. All I knew about Palestinians is that they were Arabs and whatever it is that I was told, you know. And again, I was born and raised in Jerusalem, which is supposedly a mixed city. You know, a large portion of the Palestinian people who live in Jerusalem are, are Palestinians, but I never met them. You see them, but you never meet them. And then I began going into Palestinian cities and meeting Palestinians in Palestine and taking, taking that very uncomfortable trip out of my safe environment into their environment to meet them and see them and speak to them and then realize that there's a them and then us here, which is very, very, very clearly defined and realizing what a terribly segregated reality I live in and Israelis live in. So that is the process of humanization. You start talking to people, you start realize, you start hearing their stories. And then to me, really what was probably the most significant aspect of the humanization is realizing that even though the story I grew up with is diametrically opposed to the story that they're telling, I mean, we're not talking about nuance, we're talking about night and day, where you have to pick one. You have to do your homework and pick one. And I realized that theirs was the true story. And that is a, that is a huge shift, especially when you come from a background like mine. And that is it, and then you realize, well, from there on, everything and kind of just kind of falls into place. The you know how you view the political solution and where you feel you should do what you should do with yourself and your identity. You know, as an Israeli, your identity is tied to the mythology, to the so-called history. So that was the process of humanization, and and then you realize the, you know this 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 this, this ingrained racism is really just racism. Before I ask you about the current situation. I mean, I'm interested in, you know, the fact that throughout history, oppressors have often dressed themselves in the garbs of victimhood. But in this particular case, it's true that Jewish people throughout history, I mean, obviously, I'm being careful here not to make the state of Israel synonymous with the Jewish people. But in terms of the story that is told, has a factually grounded basis that 2000 years of persecution culminating within living memory at the attempt to physically exterminate the Jewish people, two thirds of all European Jews killed in a very short space of time. So that story that is told has a huge power, which is, look, we suffered this persecution. There are times throughout history when we felt safe. We felt safe in France, in the republicanism. Then there was the Dreyfus affair. And all of a sudden, there was a wave of anti-Semitism at the beginning of the 20th century. There's always this sense of, we feel safe, then we're forced to flee, so we're never safe. We need a land of our own. That's the only place we'll ever finally be, have the security that we were denied throughout our history. That has a huge power to it. I'm just wondering... You know, that's something which I'm sure you were raised hearing a lot. So I'm just wondering how you you, you broke from that and, and, and why, what your answer would be when people say that, for example. You know, I, I have my answer, but I think what's actually more important is the answer of people who were actually survived um, the Holocaust and um, or are descendants of survivors and ended up rejecting Zionism and rejecting Israel. I think it's important to note also that the vast majority of the survivors of, of the Holocaust did not go to Palestine, rejected Zionism, you know, with, with, by their actions. If not, you know, if not, you know, verbally, then by their actions, they either went back home to Europe or went to other places where they thought they would find tolerance. And um, a friend of mine who is a survivor, uh, Jacques Boudet, who's Belgian, he lives in Brussels, he says the, the, the notion that somehow the answer to the murder of his family, his parents, is this militarized racist state that engages in enormous crimes against humanity is is insulting, is grotesque. 
What we need was humanity. What we need is education. What we need is tolerance. And you're not going to get that by creating this, this monstrosity in Palestine. You know, this genocide of Palestinians is cannot possibly, nobody can really seriously think that that is, that is the answer to, uh, to the suffering of Jews in Europe mostly. And, um, and, and, and this, I think this, this answers really that question. Now, it's interesting also that the only people who actually thought that creating this uh, idea, this Jewish, so-called Jewish state in Palestine were people that wanted nothing to do with Judaism and nothing to do with Jews. I mean, they were repulsed by Jews. If you read what the early Zionists said about the about European Jews, it is horrifying. It's horrifyingly anti-Semitic, really, even though they were Jews. You know, they wanted nothing to do with Judaism or with Jews. They wanted their own little European colony. Um, and they, you know, through, through, through whatever process they ended up choosing to go to Palestine. So the fact that the Zionists were able to connect between the suffering of Jews and what they do to the what they've been doing to Palestinians, you know, is understandable perhaps. I mean, that's one way to legitimize your crimes. But the fact that the world is buying into it, hmm. the fact that three years, three years after the end of World War II, three years hmm. after the, the horrific massacre of Jews ended in Europe, the world allowed an apartheid state to be established in Palestine and a genocide to be take pl to take place with massive ethnic cleansing, and this is you know a shot you know a stone's throw from 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 Europe. I mean, it's not like some remote place that nobody knew what was going on. Everybody knew what was happening there, and the fact that it was such a short time after the end of one atrocity that they allowed this other atrocity to take place, supposedly as an answer, is 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 really it's grotesque. I mean, it's the only word I can think about. I can I can think of to to explain this. We're three months now into, I don't know, the unspeakable horror. I don't really, I mean, as you know, um, well, I mean, I, I kind of hinted at South Africa, for example, now is taking Israel to the International Court of Justice, the top UN court, accusing it of genocide. And it has two, two uh, pillars to its claim. One is uh, conduct and the other is uh, intent. Um, and that document is already... I'm afraid to say it's a brilliant document. It's really meticulously evidenced, hundreds of footnotes. Um, but the intent is already out of date because the amount of just genocidal statements coming out of senior Israelis, yeah. politicians, officers, I mean, it's, it's, de it's a daily occurrence. Uh, the Attorney General had to intervene and tell them to stop making genocidal statements, uh, which was quickly disregarded, I noted. But I mean, but there has been an attempt to say the clock began on the 7th of October. Um, and that's framed the way a lot of the media has gone on to talk about this. You deny the atrocities committed against civilians, for example, the 7th of October, and that's framed all of this. What's your view in terms of just that attempt to basically, the, the clock began at that moment, the 7th of October, that's how this has to be understood? Well, I think that uh, perhaps for, you know, legal uh, judicial uh, reasons, it makes sense. I'm, I'm not a legal scholar, but I think that ignoring 75 years of, of Israeli statements and actions that are genocidal, without any question. I mean, the erasure of a people, the taking of a country, the mass ethnic cleansing, the apartheid state that was established, the changing of the name of the country, the cities, the street names, the destruction of monuments, the, the elimination of a history, the denial of the existence of the people to begin with. I mean, and then of course, the physical destruction of a people, that's, that's textbook genocide. And that's what's been taking place for 75 years. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's obviously good that it's taking place. However, the fact that Palestinians had to pay this enormous price for the world to, to, to engage in this is, is again, it's, 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 a, it's a stain that I think won't be removed from the conscience of, of, of people around the world. You know, oh, I mean, in a sense, what I meant is the attempt by those who defend Israel's onslaught against Gaza to say the clock began on the 7th of October. Oh, I see. Yeah, what well, that was a brilliant answer, by the way. So I'm glad you gave it. So, but uh, but in in terms, it was it was a very eloquent answer about. I mean, interesting because I think the point you're making is what there is, you know, and it's interesting because the Polish Jewish lawyer who coined genocide made it clear it was a continuum, um, and you know, not a single event uh, needed mm -hmm. to be placed into a broader context as you just did, which was the original intention with the word genocide. But I'm just wondering in terms of those 
sorry, the pol- the apologists for what's happening. They say the clock begins on the 7th of October. But you partly answered that when you answered, to be honest. Well, I mean, they can say whatever they want. They're going to say all kinds of things. I mean, as soon as, you know, the, 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 they're defending genocide, I mean, of course they're going to say all kinds of things. I don't, most of the things they say I don't think are even worth, you know, dignifying with an answer. Um, it's it's absolutely absurd to to it's absolutely absurd to to state or to think or to assume that October seventh happened in a in a vacuum and you know I don't know how many people have already said this before me so many people have said this it's an absolutely ridiculous uh, assertion that the clock began on 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 October the seventh it's absolutely true what did begin on October the seventh I think is the the such a deep humiliation of the state of Israel and a deep humiliation of the entire defense apparatus and intelligence apparatus um, and that I think the world, you know, it's, it's, it's right in front of us right now. This entire story was a lie. Even what people thought was good about Israel, which is this great defense apparatus, intelligence apparatus, you know, modern state, it was all paralyzed. October 7th paralyzed and everything. And look at Israeli politicians. Now the entire pol- political system is, 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 is being torn apart by the participants. But other than that, I think it's, a, it's an absurd assertion, of course. I mean, I'm interested in that point you made, basically saying that actually, if we're going to talk about genocide, it goes before what what began to take place on the 7th of October. I was just interested in that sense, you know, as I said, this, if we look at genocidal incitement, whether it be an, an intent, whether it be human animals, whether it's, they're all Nazis in the in the Gaza Strip and in and, and the West Bank, there are no innocents in Gaza. Um, the president saying um, uh, that there's no such thing as, you know, innocents in Gaza because, you um, they're, they're guilty as, as, a, as a nation. I mean, it's just classic collect, collective guilt. But Benjamin Netanyahu quoting Amalek in the Bible, uh, saying, remember what Amalek did to you. And, you know, he met, he did that twice, once to the public, but once specifically to soldiers. Um, and for those, again, I keep coming up with, explaining it, but Amalek was a nation which attacked the Israelites. And that was the only example in the scriptures when God uh, ordered the Israelites to kill all men, women, and children, and, and sucklings, and livestock for that matter. But I mean, some people would go, well, look, I know it's all a bit over the top, but it's an emotional spasm. It's a response to terrible atrocities that happened from the 7th of October. But I suppose your argument is actually that's just a lot. That's the logical endpoint, basically, of what of what what began decades ago. That this is, you know, a particularly extreme manifestation, but it's where it's all heading. Yeah, it was. I mean, I, don't, I, I think I don't think I, I mean, this was easily predictable. I mean, I was talking I, you know, some of my, my older videos are, are are being you know circulated now, and on social media. And I, you know, I, I a year ago, two years ago, I was saying, you know, we're going to look at these days, at the days of you know the attacks of 2021 and and, and 2014 as the good old days. Well, what's coming up is going to be far worse unless we stop, unless we, unless we put an end to it. Now, you know, the intent, of course, is a very important part of the of the, of the genocide stature of the of of you know the crime of genocide. So if Israel bombs a hospital once, you say, well, it was a mistake. If Israel drops a one-ton bomb on an apartment building once, you say it was a mistake. But when you have a 75-year con- consistent history of Israel killing civilians, then um, I think the intent is is, 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 is is very clear, it's obvious. So, you know, that, that, that's, that's really where it stands. And this was perfectly predictable. And I think it's gonna get worse unless people, unless the world stops Israel. And I, by, by stopping Israel, I mean ends Israel, ends the apartheid state. And when I say ends Israel, I mean ending the apartheid state. Um, just to clarify, um, it's not going to stop unless the apartheid state is brought to its knees and dismantled and guarantees are put in place for the safety and security of Palestinians from this point forward. And that's it. So there's no more no more ability to destroy them and kill them and bomb them and so on. Uh, unless this happens right now, then number one, this will have been a huge missed opportunity. And number two, this is going to go on and things are going to get worse. I mean, on that, you know, people make the obvious comparisons with apartheid South Africa. And it's true, you know, the West was complicit often with uh, the apartheid regime in Pretoria and saw it as a bulwark against communism, that kind of thing. But you didn't get the same level of just devout dedication to that state. You had huge public opposition um to apartheid and you know the diff- there's obviously big differences in terms of the active unashamed unabashed support of the western states 
not just people on the right, but people who would call themselves liberals or centrists um, as well. I'm just interested in that because, you know, I interviewed today, for example, a German Israeli, and we were discussing how basically what Germany has done is take its guilt and make others pay the price for it. And obviously that's that that's a very powerful part of what the, the, the rationalization of what those Western states are doing. So how is that possibly broken? Well, I think Israel is very, you know, the Zionists are very smart and they learn from the mistakes of others. So that's important to take into consideration. Um, but they also, we have to remember, they began their campaign to legitimize their uh, their objectives long before the state of Israel was established. I mean, I have a, I have a poster here somewhere uh, folded up uh, that advertises a lecture by my grandfather in 1922. I think in Kiev or somewhere like that, speaking about, you know, the situation in the land of Israel and the Jews and the land of Israel. And he would go around campaigning. There was a, and there was a group of these, you know, highly educated, very European looking, you know, shaved faces, uh, uh, very eloquent Zionists who would go around the world promoting this idea of Zionism. And they did it very, very well. And I think they learned very, very quickly that in order to accomplish their goal in the long run, to have real, you know, real results, long-lasting results, they need to establish relations, not only with politicians, because politicians come and go, but with society. And here in the United States, you know, they learn very quickly that all politics is local, and it's probably not only in the United States. So they invest heavily in local politicians, in, um, in you know, with the press, in the education system, they make sure that the way the, you know, so, and in philo philanthropy too. I mean, you wouldn't think philanthropy, you know, a lot of phil Jewish philanthropists who donate and build libraries and, but they're also Zionists. Now these wonderful people, you're going to say, you're going to go and, uh, go up and argue with them when they say Zionism is good. So, I mean, they did a really, really good job and there's nobody countering that narrative. So today in America, eh, and I speak because this is where I live. If, if eh, any, any person, certainly a politician, wants to make, create an informed opinion or an informed decision on this issue, they do not have the tools to do that because all they have is a single narrative. The Palestinian story, the Palestinian saga has never been presented in a systemic, comprehensive way in America or anywhere in the West, I, I think it's fair to say. So people don't know. And people just, you know, simply don't know, even if they're not invested ideologically or some other way religiously with, with Zionism. This is what they get. You get it in schools, you get it in the press, you get it in the media, you get it in movies, you get it in culture. Israel is good. That's just the way it is. And so they did a really, really fantastic job. Now, the way you counter that is by countering that. You have to create, there has to be, and here in Washington, D.C., I'm working with some people on, on creating that, precisely uh, that kind of a presence. There has to be a Palestinian presence that has, that provides the story, that provides, that pushes, that places the Palestinians and the Palestinian story front and center. Most people don't know that Palestine has a history, that Palestine has a culture, that there's such a thing as a Palestine, you know, before 1948, that there's a Palestine outside of the violence and so on. That does not exist. So until I think that exists, we're not gonna be able to combat this, this you know, overwhelming support and love for Israel. Now, I will say this, there's a growing, certainly a growing sentiment you know, it, 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 people around the world, you see that millions are coming out to protest. People are standing up for Palestine. And, you know, and I travel around the world, you know, whether it's Germany or, or any, anywhere else. I give Germany as an example because that's, you know, that's considered the, the toughest place to criticize Zionism. You know, a lot of pe people come, you know, hundreds and hundreds, thousands of people come to listen and, and support. And But there's a huge gap between what people think and the public opinion and what happens in the halls of power and what happens in the media. And that gap has not, you know, needs to be filled until we fill that gap, then we're going to see more of the same. And, you know, the, people, the governments of the world are going to continue to support the genocide. When people go, well, look, there's different types of Zionism. You've got your kind of smock trich, extreme right Zionism, and then you've got your liberal Zionism and we distinguish between them. What would you say to that? I think it's absolute nonsense. There is no, there's racism is racism. There's no shades in racism. Zionism is a racist ideology. You know, the the difference between a Smotrich Zionism and Herzog, who was the president of 
the state of Israel. There used to be that kind of a difference. You know, Smotrich represents these fanatic, uh, you know, religious uh, Zionists. And Herzog represents, you know, the more moderate kind of liberal Zionists, you know, the labor kind of Zionists, right? That used to be the case. A few years ago, I think it was the year that he became president, he went to like the Hanukkah candle. And typically people come to the, you know, I remember this from the days of my uncle, my great uncle being president. You go to the president's residence, it's all of the APs come, you light the candle. Herzog went to Hebron to light a candle with the Smotrich people, with the Ben Gvir people. And when we look at his rhetoric, not only since October 7th, but even before that, he brought a, a, a kind of a, a reconciliation between the two types of Zionism. And, you know, the, the, they're, all, they're just as racist, they're just as violent, there's no question about that, but there's the, the shades of, of how they express themselves is different. When he went to Hebron and sat there with these racist thugs, with these, you know, the representatives of, of, of people like Smotrich and ben you know, in, in the Ibrahimi Mosque, the part of the Ibrahimi Mosque that was taken and, 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 and given to the settlers, that was the end of this myth of this kind of idea that perhaps there is another aspect to Zionism. Now, I, I, I know that there was no such thing, no difference in terms of actions because the ethnic cleansing of 1948 in the first few decades of the running of the apartheid state was done by liberal Zionists, by labor and, you know, left of labor and so on. So I know that that is an absurd, it's, it's a ridiculous assertion. They're just as violent, they're just as vile. But the rhetoric was different. So uh, again, Herzog really closed that circle and said, we are all one. And that's the end of that. So anybody who still claims that this is true is out of their minds. I mean, in terms of, you know, alternatives, you know, the classic is a single democratic secular state where all have equal rights. And it seems like an incredibly appealing proposition, but it, it now just seems more utopian than ever. Just the, the, the idea that that's something which would ever possibly, you know, how would we get there from A to B? What do you think about that? Just in terms of, you know, a shared land where, where Jews and Palestinians live together as equal citizens. What do, what do you think of just the, even the prospects of that as a possibility? Well, given that the only other possibility, the only other option is what we're seeing now, I don't think it's utopian at all. I think it's quite realistic. I think it's the only solution, it's the only scenario where at the end of the day, Israelis and Palestinians will be able to live in peace. So if, if this is something that people feel strongly about, that Israelis and Palestinians should be able to live in peace, because the reality is there are two nations in Palestine now. You've got about six or so million Israelis and about seven or so million Palestinians. That's the reality. Now, if we if we allow the apartheid state to continue and the genocide to continue, this is this is it. We're going to see more of this. There's no other option. If we do believe that there's a possibility, if we do want to see the possibility of peace materialize, the only way to do that is dismantle the apartheid state and create a free democratic Palestine with equal rights from the river to the sea. That's the only scenario that leads to peace. Now, if we were sitting here and it was 1988 or even 1989 and somebody suggested the fall of apartheid and that Nelson Mandela would be president within five years, you know, if you would have said that's utopian, it's absurd. But when the process begins, it, it moves very quickly. So, like I said earlier, I think we're at a watershed moment. October the 7th created an enormous possibility. And we've seen that Palestinians are capable of great sacrifice and great courage. The question is, are we going to stand by them and make sure that they do not have to suffer anymore, make sure that they do not have to live in fear and terror as they have been for 75 years? And the bonus to that would be that Israelis and Palestinians, in other words, this will benefit Israelis as well, can live in peace in a free Palestine. So that's the only question. That's really the only conversation I think, you know, that is relevant here. I mean, just a couple of final things, I mean, linked to that. I do think it's quite fascinating how this has politicized a lot of people, particularly younger people. And the polling shows that a younger generation of Americans are the most pro-Palestinian ever. And that should panic Israel, because without US patronage and support, Israel would not be able to get away with what it's doing now. 
But it's also particularly interesting that there's a generation of younger Jews in America, Jewish Americans, often actually very steeped in involvement in pro-Palestinian activism. So I'm just wondering, do you think partly that's how we get there? Because, you know, I've interviewed, for example, Gideon Levy. He's a very courageous Israeli journalist. And the point he makes is, to be honest, things are just too, you know, the, the atmosphere in Israel is so catastrophic that people are radicalized to such a degree. If you look at the polling of Israelis, of Jewish Israelis, then the, you know, most think not, not enough firepower is being used in Gaza. Well, I don't even know what that looks like. 70% of all residential homes have been damaged or destroyed. So I just think, you know, what do you think about that? Do you think actually part of how this ends is American public opinion, a younger generation shift away? And that includes actually, I would say, a lot of younger American Jews. Well, these are two separate questions. You know, uh, I know Gideon Levy well. He's a great guy, but he is a, but he is inherently a pessimist. But he's not wrong. I mean, you know, I remember years ago during attacks on Gaza, I'd be in a cab in, in, in taking a taxi in Jerusalem. And if you're sitting with uh, an Israeli driver, then a conversation is, why don't we kill more? If you're sitting with the Palestinians is, you know, how do we end this? That's the conversation. But that, I think, assumes that somehow the change will come as a result of Israelis agreeing to this or changing their mind about this. You know, whites in South Africa did not wake up one morning feeling good about black people. You know, it took years of massive sanctions and, 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 and boycott and divestment. And it took, you know, Cuba had to send tanks to Angola to, get, to, to push the apartheid South Africa out of, uh, you know, in a row, start, rolling, start rolling them back. And, and so on. So, I mean, it's going to take enormous effort. And with the demand, I believe, whether they're Jews or not Jews, I mean, it's really good to see American Jews care about Palestine. And, um, and it is growing. Uh, you know, people are approaching me, people who went to these, you know, very Zionist Jewish schools in, in, in America are now waking up and saying, oh, my God, you know, I just got a letter from somebody who was like starting a campaign and so on. But what needs to happen is there needs to be a demand not for ceasefire, which is what we're seeing mostly, not just a general demand to end the genocide, which is overwhelming, but a specific demand for sanctions, mm. a specific demand to kick Israel out of any international arena to make sure that not a single Israeli team is allowed to participate in international sports, that not a single Israeli academic which represent, who represents the state of Israel is allowed to participate in academic arenas and cultural and diplomatic and that, you know, Israeli diplomatic missions must be closed down. You know, that has to happen. The American, the, the U.S. Naval Sixth Fleet is in the Mediterranean. They, Americans need to demand that these carriers go there and support the Palestinians now and provide humanitarian aid now and, and, and impose a no-fly zone over Gaza. That needs to be the demand, you know. And so what we're seeing, we are seeing, you know, there are more and more people supporting the Palestinian cause calling for an end to the violence against Palestinians, but we're not seeing the clarity, which is, which is, I think, crucial. And that's in clarity of what we're demanding. You know, an American politician today needs to know that if they associate themselves with Zionism and or British or, or whoever the case may be, wherever it is, you know, whatever countries people actually run for office, they need to know that if they associate with Zionism, if they associate with Israel, if they're not willing to stand up and call for sanctions, they will not be elected. They will not receive a vote. That has to be made clear. And that is not being made clear, even though public opinion is growing uh, towards, towards, towards you know, justice in Palestine. So that is the problem that I'm seeing. But certainly it's not going to happen because, it's, of course, Israelis are violent. They're going to get more and more. And like this course in Israel, this is not new. I mean, years ago, I remember people talking about uh, Amalek and, and, and that the Arabs are Amalek and all this kind of stuff. I remember this growing up. The point is that... We need to end it, and we need to end it forever. Right. And we need to guarantee the safety and security of Palestinians. And we need to talk about how we do that. And we need to demand that our politicians apply all the pressure they can possibly apply to bring that forward. That's a very rousing way to, to end it. A very, I certainly think a lot of people will be, I think, moved and inspired. Partly, I think, we're desperate for that, given the, the desperation of the current situation. Yeah. It seems sometimes hopeless but actually we need that this partly not just for people's sanity but just for strategy people need to know there's a direction um in which we're headed um because otherwise it just feels like a lot of outrage and misery and fury but 
with, with, but with, with no possible ro roadmap that we can all walk towards. And I think that's a very practical contribution. So thank you so much, Miko. Yeah. It's been uh, a huge honor. Do share those listening or watching this. Do share, do like and subscribe. Get the word out there. Miko, it's been a real honor. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.